most companies across all types of companies, startups to establish ones and across all levels, APMs to even directors, right? You always have a product sense interview because you want to see how does this person solve things, right? How are they, are they able to, you know, like uh, think through a problem space and get to an outcome and then how do they do it? Like, how is the thinking process? How do they make these subjective decisions? How do they demonstrate product sense in some sort of pseudo real life example? So there are three types of such interviews. One is design X. Uh, what you mean by design X is the saying that, hey, can you design um, an app that helps, uh, you know, like, you know, X do Y. That is typically what a lot of these uh, interviews come like, like, can you design an Uber for blind people? Can you, de can you design a refrigerator for someone who is, uh, who has kids in the house? Uh, right so they will tell you what to design and who to design it for other times it's more generic that they will say very broad statements like can you design a health app that will help indians stay fit after 50 now it's so vague right uh you, you will i have also gotten questions as vague as that and as specific as design like a water cooler for uh you know a town in chennai near chennai or so on the second type of question is improve why which is uh, similar to what Karishma said on the chat, right? How would you improve any feature on Duolingo language app? Or other interviewers do something like, hey, what are your three favorite products you spend most time on? Like you'll say, what's up, Instagram? You say, okay, Instagram. How will you improve uh, engagement on Instagram? Then like, that's the question, improve something. The third is strategy, which is like at, at a very broad or a vague level. Usually you ask this to more seasoned professionals, right? Something like... Uh, as an example of strategy is, hey, you are the PM of WhatsApp UPI. Uh, WhatsApp UPI has barely 0.1% market share, even though 600 million or 500 million odd people use WhatsApp in India. Then why are PhonePay and Google Pay having like, you know, 40%? So if you're a head of UPI at WhatsApp, what would be your strategy to boost your share of UPI? Now that strategy kind of question is very broad. Uh, regardless of the type of questions, the first thing you need to do when you answer is frame your core goals. What are the goals of this, right? So when you say UPI um, in India or, or WhatsApp, right? You will say that, hey, what are the goals? Then they will say, Achha, it's about getting, is it about getting more users using UPI? Is it about market share in terms of transactions of UPI? Is it market share in terms of volume of money through UPI, right? So difference between number of transactions and volume is essentially on one, you will optimize to get people doing very lots of smaller transactions on volume. You just want like, if doesn't matter how many times they transact, all of the high value stuff should be on WhatsApp. How that can change your solution is that when it's smaller value things, you will suggest P2P payments, bill payments. If it's larger things, you'll suggest that, hey, allow people to maybe pay home loans or to pay education loans through WhatsApp UPI because that gets you a larger volume. Uh, so find the frame goals and break down into smaller pieces. So you will say, for example, the same question of how do you improve WhatsApp UPI? You might say stuff like uh, the way of, you know, like say the interviewer says, it's just about the total number of, uh, total amount of money that is flowing through WhatsApp as a market share should be as close to Google Pay PayPayTN. So now then you will break down the problem that, hey, if I want to improve the volume or increase the volume of money flowing through WhatsApp UPI transactions, I can get more users to transact on UPI, which is then a growth problem. I can get users to, uh, you know, transact for bigger amounts on WhatsApp, right? Uh, which is like a trust problem or a feature offering problem. What features do you offer them that gives them a use case to pay? Like if you tell people, hey, you can pay for your car on WhatsApp, like buy a five lakh car, 10 lakh car, and you pay on WhatsApp, that gets you that number. Very stupid uh, example, but yeah, I mean, something like that, right? Uh, the third way you would do it is getting people to transact more, uh, more frequently. So total number of people, number the amount per transaction and number of transactions, then you get three themes. Then you go into each theme and you say, in this theme, I'll do X, Y, Z, in this one, I'll do A, B, C. And that's how you uh, take a very complex problem. You find out the core goals and you break it down into three or four or two or five, whatever, smaller pieces. And then you start solving each problem in a smaller way. It, 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 you'll get better answers that way. A uh, third thing is as you solve product sense interviews, work with the structure. Uh, you will notice across this PPT and even when I'm trying to give an example of UPI, I'm trying to reinforce structure. Like there's this problem A and then you break it down to X, Y, Z and then this is this. All right. So un unless you have that structure, it's very difficult for the interviewer to listen to a stream of ideas. I mean, I've seen some candidates probably not understand this well enough. And when you ask them how to improve something, they tell me 10 ideas. Now, the least you can do is break it down into themes of ideas, right? Here are these ideas around this theme, that theme. These are two, three ideas. 
Uh, the worst thing to do on such questions is to just say, I will do X or ABC and then proceed to drawing out or you'll do ABC without maybe looking at all the potential, uh, uh, you know, problem scope of that, that particular question. Uh, so you can Google this um, structure called circles. It's also from cracking the PM interview, the book I mentioned a while back. Uh, it will, like, I could go through this, but then it's something you can Google yourself. So like, and there are people online who've explained it better than I would have. Uh, but it essentially gives you a way of saying the right uh, context, so what, what is the idea, what is the root cause of something. And, and you're able to say when you design X, circles as a framework will help you at least cover all of the points you need to cover in your answer to such questions. Uh, you feel free to tweak a framework. I think frameworks are not to be used like, you know, tell an interview, I'm going to use circles. No, it's like hey, you use circles as a checklist. Here, as I answer this question, do I cover all of these points, all of these aspects? Feel free to add or subtract as well. The next thing is very important, whiteboard or screen share as you as, as you uh, solve these problems. It's very easy for you to understand what you're saying, but unless you anchor stuff, it's very difficult. Like if I had done the same master class without this PPT, probably some of the ideas would not have hit the way they would have because there was a structure to it, right? Because there is a visual anchor for you as you listen to me give ideas. Uh, and, and you'd have to do this a lot as a PM, just talk maybe for an hour, maybe for four hours, just on ideas and hypothesis and and flows and wireframes and so on. So as you do this, it's very important to whiteboard or share screen. I've never seen an interview that I've taken. I've taken like at least hundred interviews. Uh, I've never seen any interview I've rated as a nine or 10 on 10 who has not gone to the whiteboard or shared their screen in the first two minutes of me giving them a problem, two to three minutes. Because then you'll see them very structured. And then you're like, okay, hey, you know, at least if this person can't really solve this problem well, like it looks like they have a, a way of solving problems that will get them more success over time, right? So that, that's why it matters. Uh, the next point is keep the user central to any problem or solution. So as you go through the solution, like even the WhatsApp UP, I think you can start saying that, you know, what are the things that WhatsApp has as competitive advantages? One is that, you know, you already have your contacts on WhatsApp. So for P2P transactions on WhatsApp, it is fairly easy to embed payments in chat. Then you can also say that, you know, a lot of reason that people don't use WhatsApp is probably they think that, you know, there will be a failure. So if you are a first time user who sees adding, you know, a payment on UPI and WhatsApp, can you put something on that onboarding that tells you, you know, what is the success rate or, Hey, what happens if it fails? Cred had done this very well, where they said, if you use our UPI, if the UPI payment fails, we will refund you instantly. If your refund comes later, we'll take care of it separately. So that helps people who say that, Hey, if phone pay fails and I've, I'm paying an auto guy, um, it's very difficult, right? Because I don't know if that payment will succeed tomorrow and then I have to pay him double, but he also won't trust me enough to say, okay, you go home, I'll wait for this. Uh, so payments, you know, understanding for a user, getting a firm success or failure on a payment is really important. So that's maybe one thing you can use in that WhatsApp UPI idea that, hey, users want a success or a fail payment to be told to them immediately. So solve for that, that'll be a distinguishing factor. Uh, second last obvious, but like not a lot of people do this is provide a rational or a reasoning to your decisions. It's very easy to say we should do X. Uh, but it's more useful to an interviewer to gauge your thinking. You say we should do X because I, you know, of Y. And it's fine to say we should do X because I believe Y, right? So at least you're giving a rational. I understand what core assumptions or thinking processes or, or, or you know, uh, core hypothesis you are framing a decision on. Is there a rational reasoning? Is that reasoning and rational consistent across your answers? And the last is, you know, as you answer these questions, if you do all of the above correct, right? What gets you from an eight out of 10 to 10 out of 10 is being able to demonstrate really good creativity. How do you think 10 X? How do you demonstrate structured creativity? A lot of people, unfortunately do not do this enough. Like if I've asked someone, how do you improve app X? Uh, they'll give me some answers. Then I will try to nudge them to give better answers, right? I will be like, Hey, assume there is no constraint. Assume you have 50 engineers who are ready to build whatever you want. What will you build? And really good candidates will build right totally dream products, maybe not the most practical, but you can see that, Hey, this person at least has vision. They're able to think of really creative stuff. Uh, if, if you'd say someone tells you design a car and, and a car dashboard and all your ideas about that car dashboard is either the car you've seen all your life, or maybe some Tesla idea, and you've not come up with any one single new thing, uh, then that means maybe you might struggle at creativity as, as an aspect. So. Uh, while some ideas may be outlandish, you can say that, hey, I know this might not be, uh, you know, very practical, but yeah, this could be a, you know, useful way of solving. And then maybe you look at that idea and you say like, hey, this is a smaller version of that idea that can maybe solve a problem. 
um so things like that so when, when you say 10x again i'll say about the whatsapp problem right uh what are the other ways the other ways are of, of making this a 10x product is maybe you say that hey if you pay on uh, whatsapp upi uh it becomes automatic expense tracking for you like none of the upis have apps have that right that just because you pay for everything on upi it will automatically um you know tell you your budget tell you where you spend a lot and where you don't spend so now maybe if some app does that that might nudge me to say i'll stop using phone pay i'll use this app because i'm anyway paying on upi it's like click or scan a code and put a pin but this app gives me more value out of my experience with upi it gives me more safety it it helps me you know doesn't fail at all right so doesn't fail at all is probably one of those things that is not realistic because upi is built on payment rails which is bank code a lot of legacy code that's why you see upi failures uh but at at least if you highlight that hey the better you get at it the better it is for your uh, business objective that helps